Welcome to the Grateful American Radio Show, hosted by author and publisher David Bruce Smith. What did George Washington do that you might not know about? What did Abe Lincoln know that could change the way you think about the Civil War? You'll learn about all that and more on this special show designed to restore excitement in American history. Let's get started. American sculptor Ivan Schwartz is a painter and inventor who has always been interested in what lies in his peripheral vision. That is incredibly clear when you're here in his fantastic Brooklyn studio, Studio EIS, which stands for Elliot, his brother, and Ivan Schwartz. And they also work with their sister, Deborah. We're going to talk all about that today on the Grateful American TV show. I'm Hope Katz Gibbs, your co-host, here with David Bruce Smith, founder of the Grateful American Foundation. Thank you so much for having us, Ivan. It's a pleasure. Welcome. So what is it about the peripheral point of view, right. peripheral vision that appealed to you? Yeah. Uh, I think um, what we try to do here is differentiate between what is real and what people hold in their um, imagination um, or in their popular memory. And the best example I think I could give you might be um, if we were commissioned to do a sculpture of, of George Washington or Abraham Lincoln, where the information that we are provided as the background information visually is simply very limited, that there's a huge difference in the representation of George Washington or Abraham Lincoln when you compare all the literature. We know that so much has been written about both men and they both smiled and had great senses of humor and Washington liked to dance, but the images that we see of Washington, they're always a very sort of solid and, you know, not a very happy guy. And so the question is, how can we find some way in which to find the real person that is not the, the construct of those painters, sculptors, and photographers in the age in which those people lived? And that's what we try to do here, and that's what I think of as our peripheral vision. It exists, but you have to mine it. So that translates into finding the human part yeah. of the subject. Right. The wish to be a sculptor is not particularly usual. What and or who influenced that? I think a lot of artists become artists because they were influenced by others. They had an experience in their lives at some stage, in my case it was a high school art teacher, whose direction or pointing me in a certain direction made sense for me at that time, but also it was incredibly exciting. And, and he had an enormous influence upon me. I knew I, I had no interest in all the regular studies that would have pointed me in the direction of a pre-med uh, degree at college. So that was one part of it, and, and then I think artists are speculators, they're risk takers. They want to challenge themselves with ideas and with the possibility of creating something that maybe has never existed before. And I would say the confluence of that is quite important. But the result has been, I mean, you haven't stuck to one genre, say, say historical people, you've done people from TV, yes. like Opie and Andy from right. the Andy Griffith Show. You've done Samantha Stevens from Bewitched. Right. How did you go from you know, one particular area to you know, going outward? Uh, so um, the answer to the question uh, has something to do with when we first started making portraits. And the first credible group that we made, a group of eight or nine, was for the Richard Nixon Library in Yorba Linda, California. Um, Nixon was in a period of his life where he was re rehabilitating his image, and, he, and they created and designed a gallery of world leaders. And I can remember working way back then at Studio Ice uh, on portraits of Nikita Khrushchev and Brezhnev and Mao Zedong, and I thought, you know, this is so cool, making these people who were all, you know, enemy enemies during the Cold War. And there they were, day after day after day. Well, we got to be very good at it, and that 
and there was an aspect of self-promotion. And I suppose when we got the word out enough, people started calling us from entertainment venues and architects were asking us to do certain things. So it's not only limited to the literal or allegorical, it's also, there is also an opportunity to interest the world of entertainment or sports or, or any place where people wants to, want to tell a human story. So let's just go to the creative continuum for right. a second. When you conceive of a Khrushchev or a Nixon or a Brezhnev, is there a difference between how you think about that? For me, it's very simple, and I shouldn't really admit this, but the truth is, yes. I, I, when I was very young, I was on the high school wrestling team. And I love sports, and I still like sports, but it, it doesn't really, sports don't really get me as excited as the opportunity, let's say, to work with the, the history of the American presidency, or when we were working, even at that time, working on figures from the Cold War. They loomed as large to me in my personal life as Mickey Mantle or Willie Mays or anybody else. And also, um, it's, that's popular culture, which obviously I love and I'm affected by, but I tend to think that the people who I really become involved with, whether it's FDR or, or Lincoln or even Nixon, who was the first American president that I met, is just hugely engaging because I would otherwise never have an opportunity to meet any of these people. When you were working on Nixon, hmm. and who was not a very likable person, and assuming you're one of the many who did not care for him, was it harder to recreate him? My initial response is yes, um, but then since we're in business to continue doing what we are doing, I was not in a position to turn down that commission, even though I might have. Under the assumption that he was not one of your favorite people. Right. Were you tempted uh, to make this a palatable experience for you to you know, reshape a jowl or soften a chin or you know, to make this um, more acceptable to right. you? Do you ever do that? Um, in answer to your question, no, but you're reminding me that um, on occasion I have wanted to put a kind of subversive note into the hollow of one of the sculptures, should they ever fall down and be broken and somebody would, would discover my true feelings about <laughs> one of our subjects. But with regard to Nixon, no. The, the challenge was sort of, in a way, it's, it's my, uh, some of the people that I don't really like, I want to really get them right so other people will have the same visceral reaction I do. Probably not. But many people have asked us to make changes, especially when you deal with the uh, the rich and the famous and the powerful. People want, you know, they'd like to lose a few pounds or a few years or, you know, no wrinkles. Uh, and that happens all the time. And we try to push back as much as we can. But, you know, it's a tough slog. So yeah. historical accuracy is very important, obviously. The studio has come to be famous in a small world for really finding that historical accuracy, uh, at which we do when we're invited by great institutions to go and measure George Washington's clothing or Lincoln. And, and that's a great moment in the life of the studio. So how did you get involved in being a sculptor and having studio ice? I had a traditional training, uh, in classical training in sculpture. I had a great teacher who thought I should become the next great figurative sculptor. And I went off to Italy, as my teachers did, uh, and wound up working in an area of Italy where sculptors have been working in the laboratory of sculpture production for the past 500 years. I spent a year there, and then I came back to the United States, and within a year or two, I found my first commission, which really was the beginning of Studio Ice in 1976, now almost 40 years ago, for a museum on the Iron Range in Minnesota, a local history, culture and history museum, and I did that project. I never thought I would do another one. You know, it was a one-off, and I would have to go back to driving taxis and waiting on tables. And then about a year later, I got a call from um, somebody at Smithsonian uh, from the Air and Space Museum. They wanted to know if I'd like to go to Japan, 
well, you know, when you're very young, you love travel and you love doing what you do. And I went to Japan and did the second commission. And they started to roll a little bit, which is the moment I invited my brother to join me, since I didn't, this is very labor intensive, making large works. Um, and he joined me in Tokyo, helped me do this installation. And before we knew it, there was another commission from NASA and then a, another history museum um, in outside of Baltimore. And I thought, you know, this is, this is sticking. This is actually going somewhere. And I think it was about 1981 that we had our first really big commission. And I thought I would both be, I would become wealthy since it was such a large thing, which of course didn't happen. Um, but we were in business. We had, we'd rented a studio that we had a lease on. Before that time, we'd go from studios to, to studio, roll it up. That would be the end of it until there was another job and they could be very few and far between. But now they were sort of happening all the time. And there was a staff. And so it became necessary to feed us all, keep it all going. So we began a little bit of promotion. And gradually the, the level of the work reached a stage where, as I have described, we started doing these portrait figures. At the same time, the vocabulary of the studio is very broad. We were also working for architects and um, very high-end restaurant designers here in New York and in, in Las Vegas. So we were doing a lot of different things. And, and that's because the, my background and my brother's background is not only tied to this uh, literal figurative tradition in sculpture making. Mm -hmm. And before, even when this began, I was working as an abstract painter. He was showing his work as a photographer in galleries in New York, and so we had this sort of bifurcated life. But at a certain point, um, the art world was a bit less appealing. And the invitation to go to all of these great, august cultural institutions and work with them to do these projects became more and more fascinating to me, which is how we got, which is where we are today. So how much of the then, how much of the sculpting did you and Helia do? I mean, did, you, did, you, did the two of you do all of it, or was it divided among the staff? And how much do you do now? Um, well, it's an interesting question. Let's see what I want to tell you. <laughs> uh, well, it goes to the heart of the mythic question about who the artist is. So let's put that to rest. If we were talking about Rodin or Michelangelo, they could never produce what they produce on their own. So there are always large numbers of people in support. When the studio began, I did all the sculpting, and I trained people to work with me, but I was always, at the end of the day, I was exhausted and very dusty and dirty. Uh, Forty years later, I do almost none of the sculpting, but I direct everybody, which suits me fine because I work with a great bunch of people and I think my eye is more valuable than my skill set as a sculptor today. So Elliot is an artist, you're an artist, and your sister Deborah also works here in the yes. studio. Yes. How does that work together, that family dynamic? Have you just raised the bar for all families to be able to do this? It works with great diplomatic skill at the heart of every single day which is how we have managed to do this together for almost 40 years. I think it works because we simply trust each other, absolutely. There simply is no question of trust, and there is a great division of labor. So my brother can't do what I do, and I could never sit in front of a computer doing what he does, but the studio requires somebody, all creative organizations require somebody with their hand on the tiller and keeping the, the, the ship sort of grounded, if you will. Uh, and obviously that also requires project managers and production managers, and at Studio Ice there is a huge burden placed upon project management, which is where Deborah works, to transfer the necessary information that becomes the blueprint for making each project. Um, and I don't have a great deal to do with those areas on a day-to-day -day basis, except to sit there and listen to what they tell me. And after having done it for so long, I always know whether we're ready to go or not ready to go. So I think it's, at this point, we've honed our skills, all of them. The, we've improved the, 
the business model, which is, has always been in, in danger since this is an odd thing to be doing. Um, so we've improved that and we've also uh, improved the oper operational aegis. Um, and so I try to say goodnight to them and not speak to them until the next day. But we love each other and it's a good, it's been great. And how many people do you have working for you all together? Um, it varies based on the project demand, but in this period there'll probably be about at least 10 or 15 people working. So, how many works has <coughs> Studio ICE produced since 1976? So, David, since 1976 we have produced hundreds of projects of varying nature. And we came to an understanding not too long ago that we have produced more bronze sculptures of important historical figures than any studio in American history. Uh, so right now there are more than a hundred bronze sculptures that the studio has produced and there are hundreds of other figures that we have produced for museums. Excellent. So I hope this isn't too touchy of a question, but approximately how much does one of these sculptures cost? They, they vary greatly because, we, as you know, we make figures for museum exhibitions and they are inside and um, you know, several hundred hours goes into the making of every single one of them. Bronze figures are, could be thousands of hours. And they vary from about, I'd say, $20,000, $25,000 for one of our standard museum figures, anywhere to, from $125,000 to $200,000 for a bronze sculpture. Excellent. So could the average person come to you and say, would you do a bronze of my uncle or something? It's, um, they could, it's not, it's not my favorite thing to do because we, we're now really talking about dealing with personalities. And, and I discovered when I was living in Italy that year, I had my very first commission to make a sculpture for a family friend. And it made me so nervous, you know, whether they'd like it or wouldn't like it. I actually vowed never to do a portrait again. And here we are all these years later doing hundreds of these things. But the personal element makes it more difficult for me um, because you're, you're just in a different sort of position than working with curators with empirical information. But the answer is yes. Uh, somebody, a, a private client came to the studio just a week ago who is commissioning a full-size bronze sculpture of Abraham Lincoln, which is not a very usual thing to happen. What was the longest running project? The National Constitution Center in Philadelphia is the largest project of its type um, and the longest running project that we ever worked on. Two and a half years, roughly, on one project. 42 life-size bronze sculptures of the signers of the U.S. Constitution. Yeah. Which, by the way, came at an amazing moment because we used to have a studio not far from here with a full view of the World Trade Center. And we were at work on that project when the towers went down in 2001. And there were an awful lot of people who came to the studio for work, and I know that that work gave them great solace working on this project for the Constitution Center in that moment. Of the hundreds of projects you've done, what is your favorite and why? Well, I love the Constitution Center because it was a great challenge. You know, there was a certain amount of time in which to produce all of this work, which took an, an, an enormous amount of organization and the staff was double the size and we had to find sculptors to help us from all over the world. So that was a great challenge and I love that. But it's, and I love the work and I love what it feels like because it was a surprise to me when the work was actually finished. I expected to see an empty room with old fashioned bronze sculptures. Instead what we saw was in a way the signature piece of the Constitution Center where school groups just mobbed all of these old guys who our founders and I just love that. It was so unexpected. But maybe the singular figure that I love most of all is the Lincoln on the steps of the New York Historical Society. I just think it's a very beautiful piece and it's very evocative. Um, and I love the idea of Lincoln in, in New York. Um, great stories aside from, you know, the making of that sculpture. Uh, but even here in Brooklyn. So I, I love that piece. 
So Ivan, your sculptures are in such amazing places, including Mount Vernon, where it's George, Martha, and the grandchildren, and they're, they're touched and beloved, and Jefferson, where you can see people touching his head and his shoulders. What, what happens to these sculptures as they go through time? Um, some people like it. Some people like the wear and tear. You know, it sort of indicates that, they're, that people are using them or they're getting close to them. Um, there is a point. I mean, Benjamin Franklin had his glasses ripped off his head several times, and so many people touched his face that he, he looked like he'd been, um, you know, sort of experienced an atomic bomb. So there is a point at which the deterioration goes too far. But he's probably the only singular figure, except perhaps Teddy Roosevelt at the American Museum of Natural History, where they get four million people a year. And people love that piece. So um, yes, we go back. Um, but for the most part, people are respectful and they survive. So Ivan, for people who want to be sculptors, mm. What is your advice? My response to your question is so curmudgeonly and, you know, it makes me feel so old. It, you, you really have to think about what you're getting into. You see, when you're very young, I mean, you're just full of ambition and the thrill and um, the challenge. You travel the world, you go and ingest everything that makes you excited about what you're doing. But then, you know, 20 years and 30 years later, you, you have to live by your wits and you have to live by the product of your endeavor. We've managed to do that, but it's the rate of attrition for people who study art and then who give it up because they can't make it, it's huge. So that's, a bore, that's the boring response. That's the real world response. But the real answer is you have to be willing to get stuck into it. You have to be willing to fail. Um, and if need be, you have to be willing to change what you do because it may or may not work. It's probably true for everyone and everything. Sure. Artists sure. especially though. Sure. So our last question for you is clearly you've hit the pinnacle of your career or what appears to be to us. What lies ahead for you? It's, this is a great watershed moment. So I can't actually think what lies way ahead. The stat, let's see, the Statue of Liberty has been done. <laughs> um, it would be great to have a challenge at that scale. Um, but we have an enormous amount of work in front of us right now uh, for great American institutions. Um, and we're very excited about all, all of these projects. And, and it rep all of that work represents almost three years into the future. So this really is a great moment for us. Thank you so much for having us at your studio, Ivan. This has been fantastic. Uh, it's been my pleasure. This is a great day for us. And please come back to Brooklyn. You are watching The Grateful American TV Show. I'm Hope Katz Gibbs, your co-host, here with David Bruce Smith, founder of The Grateful American Foundation. We're looking forward to restoring enthusiasm in American history for kids and adults. And we'll talk to you soon. You have been listening to The Grateful American Radio Show, hosted by author and publisher David Bruce Smith. Here's to restoring enthusiasm in history for kids and adults, too.